Anyway, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, according to whatever part of the world you are in. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much to Flint, Mary and Jackie for the invitation. Uh, obviously, this is uh, the world is a subject which is quite close to my heart, and uh, I suppose it is to most people, and uh, I think we all want to save it. Um, one, I, I, I would like to start providing a little bit of an explanation of my title. Uh, don't wait for a better world, make it happen. That has been a little bit of the story of my life in the sense that I have been constantly frustrated in many situations, whether in the academic environment or in other situations when people would just say, okay, this is really bad, but you have to be realistic and work with these things. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't have to accept things that are bad. You have to challenge them. And, uh, and I think this is what I have tried to do all my life and what I keep trying to do. And I think it's archaeologists have been absolutely brilliant at it. And so this is why um, I'm talking about the positive vibes of archaeology. And this is what the rest of this brief presentation is going to be about is just to say, to emphasize the positive role that the archaeologists have had on, on the world, on social life, and on our future. Okay. Okay, can you see my second slide? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about ICATS. So archaeologists are lucky to have uh, uh, an international organization of reference, which is the International Council of ICAT Zoology. If you're not a member of ICAT, I very much encourage you to become one and, uh, and join our world community. Um, I mean, ICAT has been an important reference point more than just any ordinary professional organization is because uh, it has really provided an opportunity for people to come together, to share things, to support each other, so on and so forth. And that has a lot to do also with the history of ICATS and how ICATS was started. And uh, my good friend and uh, long-standing colleague, Laszlo Bartosiewicz, recently wrote this uh, little piece for the ICATS newsletter about the fact that the ICATS had become 50 years old. And one thing Laszlo has often reminded us of is that actually ICATS started really on the back of the problems generated by the so-called Iron Curtain, basically that line that divided countries uh, which were under, let's say, Russian or, or, or American influence. And um, a subject that for very sad reasons has become very kind of topical recently again. Um, and uh, the first conference, although it wasn't called ICATS yet, and uh, it was really the very beginning, was held in Budapest in 1971. And I think the great thing about that is that uh, at the time, many of people who are here are, young, are too young to remember that, but at the time, there really was this divide between people working in the West and in the East. And there was very little communication, which was very sad and on the verge of tragic, really. And ICATS, even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, actually gave a very important contribution to put these people together. And I have one personal memory of this is in particular, I was in London, it was my very first year in England in 1991. And it was only two years after the, 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 the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I remember two uh, former Eastern German, well, two Eastern German archaeologists, very well known, Manfred Teichert and Hans Hermann Müller, uh, came to visit uh, London. And it was such a feast. Many archaeologists from all over the country came to meet them in London, and they gave papers. And uh, there was really a celebration of this kind of East, Mid, West 
um, connection, which obviously had a very important political significance. So I think that that kind of positive vibes, I think that is the expression that the ICATS set at the very beginning, have very much continued, and there have been multiple attempts to again uh, to internationalize and especially. Uh, to create uh, some kind of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, which is totally international. Um, in terms of other initiatives, uh, Jackie, you see, I uh, introduced myself uh, uh, and I 22 years ago in the year 2000. Goodness me, Jackie, so much time has passed. We created uh, this tool called ZUAC, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Uh, well, Zuark, we really didn't have any clue at the time when we created it, that it would have such a big impact on the zoarchaeology community. But why am I mentioning Zuark now in this particular context? Well, as many people, many contributors to Zuark have said many times over the years, Zuark is a kind of point of reference where people know that they can find friends. They can find people uh, to whom they can ask questions without any fear. And that there is a huge amount of a kind of collaboration and, uh, and uh, um, in an attempt to support each other. Uh, this might look like a bit of a platitude, something that is rather obvious. But it isn't. And the reason why it isn't is the political context in which we operate. Our economic and political system has been, not all over the world, but in most of the world, dominated in the last few decades by the kind of neoliberal uh, concept of free trade and so on. Neoliberal, which I always like to mention the fact that as Noam Chomsky rightly said, is neither new nor liberal. And, uh, and uh, basically it's an ideology in which the concept of competition and basically doing well, despite not necessarily the expenses of the other, although it, it is often at the expenses of the other, but despite the others has become dominant. And, uh, and, uh, and we are proud of the fact that many of the, our initiatives as a zooarchaeologist, including Zoar, go very much in the different direction. We don't want to do well at the expenses of the others. We actually want to help others. Uh, a few years ago, I happened to edit uh, this book, the Oxford Handbook of Zoarchaeology, and uh, the spirit that guided uh, this publication was very much in line with what I had learned through my ICATS and Zoarch experience. Basically created something that was an international tool and uh, in which it was very good representation from kind of multivocal, as the postmodernist would say. And uh, so there were different representation from many different countries, different perspectives. Uh, and uh, and uh, so it was a kind of comprehensive, but also welcoming place for the archaeologists. At the same time, I'm mentioning uh, the Oxford Handbook of Zoarchaeology because the production of that book also uh, made me confront the problems that we have. Uh, so the problem are, uh, well, may, there are many problems, but one of the key problems is that the kind of inequality and injustice that affect the world nowadays mean that as much as we want to overcome them, we have to confront some basically structural issues. I mean, zooarchaeologists are not evenly spread across the world. And then we know that some very populous countries actually have very few zooarchaeologists. Is this because they are not good at zooarchaeology or at archaeology? Of course not. The reason is because we don't, they don't have the same opportunity. So inevitably, uh, we end up with confronting this problem and try to address it as much as we can, but it's never, we, are ne we never quite uh, go as far as we would like. That certainly was the case for the production of this book. As people often say, you know, charity starts at home. So I, when I started working in Sheffield in, uh, in, uh, in 2004, 
as somebody slightly more important than me said one day, I have a dream, I have a dream, and I had this dream that I wanted to create a team of people who would actually work with each other, collaborate with each other, uh, go completely against, against the typical um, context of academic uh, life where you have to push for success at all costs. And that is not what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a relaxed environment uh, made of friends who would, again, as I mentioned many times before, be supportive of each other. I think it, was, it has been a quite successful experiment and we had many, many great moments together. Here you see just a few photographs of those times. And the one photograph I want to point out, I don't know if you can see my cursor pointing, but it doesn't matter that much. Basically, if you see the photograph on the bottom right, uh, uh, that was taken last year when I, I gave my inaugural lecture. And you see that uh, we are here showing, and I'm actually wearing, which I'm wearing also now, although you can probably see, you can probably see it, the Save Sheffield Archaeology t-shirt. What is that? Uh, well, first, let me say that um, uh, one of the things we did as a team uh, was to make a huge effort to be socially and politically conscious. Uh, and so we were always, for many years, so always uh, we were on, on the first uh, line when it was a question of fighting for something, when we were picketing for trade union activities, always lots of members of the archaeology team were there, at rallies were there, we would meet at the kind of climate environmental rallies and so on and so forth. So when, uh, as some people will know, uh, we are currently facing the tragedy that the last year the management of the University of Sheffield decided to close our department, a very historical and successful and well-known department of archaeology all over the world. Uh, so this was really shocking uh, and terrible news for us. And we started a very, very strong campaign uh, to fight the, this decision and that the T-shirt to save Sheffield archaeology are part of this campaign activity. But one thing I wanted to say is that what happened in this campaign is that immediately the archaeology team ended up being at the forefront of the fight. And why was that? Because in a way we were already there, we were already prepared to that kind of political activism. I mean, I personally have 40 years of experience of political activism, but many other people in the team, they were already there. Their mentality was, was there. They had this kind of fighting mentality for justice that uh, really helped the campaign. So yeah, I think I mentioned Steve Sheffield Archaeology. Uh, I have uh, distributed the, to the organizers the link to our petition that probably maybe most of you have already signed, but it's still there after almost a year. We're still collecting signatures. So if you haven't signed or if you know somebody who hasn't signed, please do pass the link around, okay? So what is it that we are trying to save the world from? So I wanted to conclude this talk with a few considerations about that. Well, I think many of these things won't come as news to you, but I think once again, I wanted to emphasize the role that the archaeologists have had and they can carry on having. Well, one of the things that obviously is concerning and affecting all of us is the current environmental and climatic catastrophe. Okay, so what can we do uh, in terms of helping in that area, which is absolutely fundamental for the future of humanity and the planet? Well, first of all, one thing I always say, archaeologists have a perspective of humanity that no other discipline has. So the moment in which we talk of humanity about it and its future, obviously the role of archaeologists is absolutely fundamental. And when we talk about the relationship with the natural world, which is in a way one of the key things we're discussing here, uh, obviously the relationship with animals uh, is, uh, is, uh, is very, very important. And, uh, you know, the massive extinctions that we have nowadays are uh, clearly 
a cause and at the same time a consequence of the environmental and climatic crisis. And uh, as zoo archaeologists, we can provide knowledge regarding this. We can talk about how people of the past uh, have dealt with these issues and, uh, and uh, how they dealt with extinctions, introductions with the climatic change, so on and so forth. So a perspective which is quite unique. So we can offer knowledge. But I think one thing that I want to emphasize even more is that we should have integrity in the way we deal with these things. There are many projects and activities nowadays that are actually are absolutely disastrous in terms of the future of our planet. And we carry on pursuing them incredibly. I mean, one of the things I just wanted to mention is anything that has to do with the, the destruction of the plant world, with, whether it's deforestation, tree falling or anything like that, is absolutely suicidal because plants are the tool, the key tool that we have because they absorb CO2 and it's the key tool that we have to combat the climatic change. And, uh, and uh, there are many projects that sometimes lead to this kind of destruction. And I think the archeologists need to be aware, be careful, show your integrity, don't collaborate with that. Okay, and the other thing, don't accept any sponsorship or any kind of deal with the companies uh, extracting fossil fuels. Okay, we have to stop not right now extracting fossil fuels. This is totally incompatible with the, the, with saving our planet. So let's let's show as we've done it many times before. Let's show our integrity and let's not get our hands dirty in dealing with these people. Uh, I love the British Museum. It's a British it's a museum that uh, I love going to. But I'm boycotting it now, not only because they chose George Osborne uh, as their chairman. Uh, I hope for many of you that you don't know who George Osborne is, because your life will be better for that. Uh, but also because they still carry on accepting sponsorship for, from fossil fuel companies. And I think this is totally unacceptable. War, you know, obviously it's a subject that is very much at the forefront of our concern at the moment because obviously the terrible invasion of Ukraine by Russian troops, by Russian government, I would to say, not by Russian people, but by Russian government. And, uh, but we shouldn't forget that there, there are other wars in the world and that there have been terrible wars, even in very recent years. One that I want to single out, one of the many tragic stories is the absolutely disgusting and terrible and tragic attack on the Kurds people uh, perpetrated by the Turkish government with the tacit support of American or the then American government. Uh, so war is all over us. What can we do? Well, obviously, as archaeologists, we don't have the power to stop wars. But there is something that we have been very good at doing, and it goes back to what I was just saying about the history of the ICATS, and that we carry on doing, is we can prevent wars. The best way to prevent wars is to create some form of friendship across borders. Okay, so any form of international collaboration, any form of exchange, any activity that puts people together is one small step preventing, preventing any form of xenophobia and also any form of dis, uh, distrust of people across uh, borders. You know, I personally, I'm for no borders at all, but uh, I, 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 uh, I accept that not, not everybody would agree with me, but where people would agree is that we have done a huge amount to put people together across the world and we need to carry on doing that. One of the tragic aspects of Brexit, uh, you know, especially for people like me living in the UK, is the fact that that actually has generated lots of barriers to that kind of international friendship and collaboration. 
all this is obviously related, but at the same time, it needs to be specified that also we live in a world where social and global injustice are, are rampant. Uh, um, I mean, social injustice, obviously, even within one country, uh, not all the people have uh, the same opportunities. Uh, opportunities are very much dictated by wealth, by connections and so on. And this is great injustice. Um, internationally, we have a problem of global injustice, which is largely a consequence of, of colonialism and uh, colonialism, which in Nifum forms carries on uh, nowadays. So this is why I talk of compensation. I mean, the minority world has pillaged the majority world for centuries. Uh, so what we need is not charity, okay? We don't have to help uh, as for the people who are here, uh, who live in the minority world. Uh, we don't have to help the majority world. We owe the majority world a lot because we have really, quite often stolen from them, destroyed their economy and so on and so forth. So forms of compensation and some kind of positive bias. ICAS has been good at doing that, for instance, recently opening, opening up free membership for, for, for uh, members from countries from the majority world. But also we do need to share as much as we can our resources and again, uh, we have been doing that, but uh, there's more to do. And, uh, and uh, the other thing is uh, the, the greatest uh, power that uh, we can have is education, okay? Education always goes against injustice, uh, always against, goes against tyranny and dictatorship and oppression. Uh, we need to provide education which is free. And, uh, and which is available to everybody, which is ag exactly against the direction that a lot of the world, especially the, the minority world is going nowadays. Let's suppose that, let's, let's demand vocally free education, which means lots of things, not just getting an, a university degree, but uh, anything that we can do to spread knowledge and to teach people um, freely, it's a good thing to do. And it's also an obligation that we have. All these problems are combined around the concept of greed. Okay, greed is what causes the environmental and climatic catastrophes, what causes war, is what causes social and global injustice. In order to combat greed, obviously the, the kind of solidarity among people, which goes exactly in the opposite direction, sharing rather than trying to keep it to yourself, is absolutely key. Zoo archaeologists have been very good at sharing knowledge. So we are already there, and I'm very proud of being part of this community, which, by the way, I have had from many sources regarded as a, some kind of model around the, around the world of research. You know, we are really regarded as a model. Many people have told me that, and we should really be proud of that. But I think one thing that is very important is that, that it's not enough and I think some of the examples I've shown today maybe demonstrate that it's not enough to have ethical integrity and a social, um, um, you know, and to be socially conscious. We do need political responsibility. I mean, many people don't like the idea of becoming political, especially people who are researchers and who are academics and say, oh, politics is not something we want to be involved with. But actually, uh, you know, politics doesn't mean that as a archaeologist, we decide to embrace a particular ideology or a particular political party. Obviously, that would be completely crazy. We do need the diversity of opinion. But what we need is political responsibility, political consciousness, and, uh, and political knowledge, because many of the issues of injustice uh, that we are dealing with are actually political. Um, you know, an, an important book in archaeology 
uh, which was published uh, quite a few years, well, maybe about 10 years ago, I can't remember exactly, it's by, by, edited by, this collection of papers edited by Yanis Aminlakis and Philip Dew. Forget about uh, the main title, archaeology and capitalism. I think uh, the main, import, most important concept is in the subtitle, from ethics to politics. Because quite often people in the research world have hidden behind the fact that they were creating ethical committees, uh, uh, you know, ethical discussions about issues. And uh, there were often excuses for not really engaging with the political issues that actually uh, are at the basis of a lot of injustice that we are confronting with. Okay, so that's that's my appeal. Do understand politics because if you don't understand it, your approach to fighting injustice will always be rather superficial. Um, so should the archaeologists of the world unite? Well, I don't think we need to because we are already there. We are already united and that is really the great news. Um, we are a really very strong international community and that therefore we have a lot of that we can offer. So what is it that we can do better? Uh, I think is our unity, as I mentioned before, is an example, is a model, and that we can use that unity to basically exercise the power that we have, which is given to us by that unity, to provide a model that is alternative to the, that kind of greed and competition and selfishness that uh, uh, is, I'm afraid, rather endemic to the academic and research world nowadays. We have been providing an, an alternative model. We need to carry on doing that. We can actually do a lot better with the much more political knowledge. And I think that we can save the world, not alone. Uh, but, uh, you know, saving the world always comes from the initiative of small groups of people, as Margaret Mead once said, okay, this small group of well-intentioned people is the only thing that has ever changed the world, and that is very true. And uh, I think as zooarchaeologists, we are doing great, but we shouldn't be complacent, we can do better, and this is why I cherish very much the initiative of this, uh, of this conference. We need to discuss these issues and I'm looking forward to carry on discussing them more with you guys in our chats in the following sessions. Thank you very much. Go. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, Jackie, and morning, everybody. <laughs> if I sound a bit weird, um, do not adjust your laptops. Uh, I had a molar tooth extracted um, yesterday and my face is all swollen. So if there's a, if I sound a bit weird, I apologize in advance. Also, if blood starts trickling down my face as well, I apologize in advance. Um, I'm going to briefly talk you through um, something called cryox, which is um, a sort of a parochial uh, title, really, because it's about the UK. Um, but I just wanted to say that we've been approached by quite a lot of people um, across different countries in the world um, about potentially the replicating the cryox model. So perhaps the good idea would be to almost forget that this is a UK based um, uh, initiative and think about it as an initiative that could potentially be used um, wherever there's large amounts of biological material that requires uh, biobanking. So um, it's re this is really a a kind of perspective on the last three years where we've been creating the UK's first national zoological biobank. Um, we're currently waiting on the results of a, a continuation grant, um, but even if we don't get that grant, we will be continuing the biobank anyway. And um, if there's any questions that you have specifically about it, there's an email address uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'm representing the CryoOx Consortium um, and the consortium is itself um, spread about the UK um, uh, in Cardiff, where I am, 
um, at the Natural History Museum in London, the National Museums of Scotland, uh, the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland or Edinburgh Zoo, um, at the University of Edinburgh and the University of Nottingham with two um, uh, partner biobanks, the Frozen Ark and the European Association for Zoos and Aquaria uh, Biobank as well. Um, and so what I'm gonna do really is take you through what we've developed um, and the community that we are creating. And um, I'm looking forward to discussing with you uh, your thoughts on this and whether or not you think that there are better models out there, especially um, in, in the countries that you uh, live in. So basically CryoArts is a, a, an overarching biobank that brings together a number of collections that are already existing, um, but acknowledges the fact that um, biological collections generally are incredibly fragmented. And I'm sure many of you would recognize this, that um, there's no one-stop shop really for biological material, uh, particularly zoological material out there. And what we've been trying to do is create that one-stop shop, at least for the UK. So what CryoArx does is it brings together all material that is based in the UK. Um, and that includes um, everything from whole bodies, um, DNA, blood, tissue, cells and gametes. Um, and we aim to unite essentially the, the whole community that uses this material. So academia, museums, zoos and aquaria, uh, and even industry uh, where relevant as well. And the two other biobanks that are belong or that are belong to this, the Cryox Consortium, or members of the Cryox Consortium have slightly different orientation. One, the frozen arc is very much focused on threatened species and the Yaza Biobank is zoo material. So what we're trying to do is bring together all of that stuff in one place, not necessarily always physically, but certainly using a common uh, database that is publicly searchable. Um, and so we aim to furnish um, the uh, academic and other research community on all sorts of levels uh, and including all sorts of organisms. Um, and this includes domesticated species, but it also includes, and we focus also quite a lot on neglected species, lots of invertebrates, um, neglected vertebrate species, um, but, uh, but really essentially trying to bring together everything that's available um, in, in one place. And uh, we, you know, we get a lot of requests for material now, and that comes from many different sectors, um, including, including um, conservation bodies, including you know, junior researchers who perhaps don't have access to some samples, um, but it's also there for, for all really to, um, to make applications to. Um, the first thing that we had to do under CryoArcs was build the infrastructure um, that was available. Al already at the Natural History Museum, there is something called the Molecular Collections Facility. Um, and that was established in 2009. Um, with a vast capacity of up to 17 um, uh, uh, frozen samples at minus 80, and um, uh, each of which could, uh, each freezer could contain 60, can contain 65,000 samples, and, and then essentially a uh, capacity for over a million samples um, stored at much lower temperatures, minus 196 in liquid nitrogen. Uh, and the idea is that the material that we have in the biobank at the Natural History Museum, the one that we've created at the uh, Na National Museum of Scotland, and the one we've created at Edinburgh Zoo, provide mutual backup support for each other. So if, you, uh, if people who are depositing samples want their samples backed up in case of a catastrophe in, in, in their own lab or in one of these labs, then we have um, essentially a, a always got insurance samples. So the idea is that um, where people are wish to do so, they can send, split their samples, send them, um, and then we will we'll make sure that they're backed up. So what is the pur pur purpose of the CryoOx project? Why did we come into being? What was the gap, essentially? Um, and I thought I'd put this quick slide up um, today because this is sort of summarizing a lot of the work that, that I and people like me do, and is, but it's just one example, really of how um, CryoArx can help with um, advancing knowledge, um, basic knowledge on, in research on all sorts of species. 
And essentially, um, obviously, as you've heard already, um, we're facing a very uncertain future. Um, and uh, because we're facing a very uncertain future, um, we need to understand what has been happening in the past and uh, what's happening in the present. And in the genetic context, uh, one of the things that we uh, are very keen to do is understand the historical demographic and evolutionary processes of species to explain why they find themselves in the situation that they do today. Some of them may be doing extremely well, but the vast majority of them are declining. And, um, and then use that information at the, using genetic data to um, project what might happen to them in the future under various scenarios, for example, climate change or anthropogenic land use change, those kinds of things. Um, and so we go from everything from DNA from museum specimens all the way through to modeling um, the, the future of populations using simulations. Um, and this domain of research, which is broadly, um, I suppose, molecular ecology or one part of molecular ecology, um, really requires um, anyone who wants to start this work to collect material that would allow them to um, address in, um, you know, questions from the past, the present day, um, to enable them to understand what might happen in the future. Um, and that's where the interaction between um, a museum, uh, science, zoo archaeology comes into helping us understand how we got where we are today with threatened species especially, um, and how we might um, uh, understand how those processes could potentially uh, give us the information we need to make sensible projections into the future under different uh, management scenarios. Um, the problem facing researchers starting this whole process is the inaccessibility of samples. So if a, um, a researcher wishes to find a particular um, sample, DNA, tissue, et cetera, they've got nowhere to go um, except that they can potentially search a few museum collections that have databases, different databases, um, and then they can write to the PI uh, of other projects who may or may not have retained the samples, um, or, um, or, or they can, they can you know, put out general requests. In general, I would say it's not a very satisfactory situation, and it makes uh, sampling very difficult. One of the, um, uh, con uh, one of the consequences of that is that people have to go back out into natural populations and resample them. And that's not something that we're particularly interested in encouraging when these populations are threatened, where people will be expending uh, air miles um, and, and for all of the reasons that have been discussed, for example, in the discussion group on neocolonialism uh, that we've just had, basically what we're trying to do is make the science as self-sustaining as possible and as least invasive as possible. So if you, under the, the Cryox um, program, researchers can search the Cryox database, they can make applications, see whether there are tissues anywhere in the UK in this instance, um, and also ask us whether we know of any, any material that could potentially be available. This is all important because um, there is a, um, the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing, which came into um, existence in 2014, has changed the regulatory landscape on the movement of samples across borders um, and make, has made it very much more difficult to obtain samples, as it should be, from um, across borders and from, from other countries. And perhaps some of the starkest examples uh, of the use of genetics in neocolonialism has been the, the wholesale uh, biopiracy of many developing countries uh, for, by Big Pharma, for instance, um, in terms of developing drugs which are then uh, sold for profit, none of which goes back to the countries of origin. Um, what we, our, our aim essentially has been therefore to grow the collection um, we've been prioritizing the samples that we look at uh, for different groups. Um, so we've developed a prioritization tool. We provided the critical infrastructure um, and that allows us now um, to offer um, a service which can be used by an, a, a large community of scientists. Um, as part of that, we've launched a large uh, co coordinated sampling initiative where sampling was already going to happen. 
So we've been able to take advantage, for example, of several research expeditions that had been planned for a long time going into the South Atlant Atlantic, bringing that material into the collection and making it available. But much more importantly, I feel, um, we've been able to rescue a lot of collections that um, the principal investigator who assembled that material is now either retired or moved on into another field. So most recently, we, we collected the UK's most uh, taxonomically diverse cell line collection from a colleague, uh, Professor Malcolm Ferguson-Smith at the University of Cambridge. Malcolm was coming to the end of his time at Cambridge and um, wanted his samples to be available uh, for research. And so we were able to send what was effectively a SWAT team dressed in lab coats to actually um, rescue that material, take it to the Natural History Museum, and uh, it's now available for, for, for other researchers, whereas it might indeed have been lost otherwise. Um, one of the things that we have to do, of course, is to create a database that people can browse. And um, we've created this database using something called Specify, which is a museum samples database, which is available um, to browse on our website, which is cryoarts.org. Um, and we've spent a lot of time um, disseminating the knowledge um, and disseminating the idea of biobanking um, with all uh, publics, um, especially with young, uh, with children uh, and young adults at school age, but also uh, with the, the adult public as well, largely because we quickly encountered the, um, the, the situation whereby people totally misunderstood what biobanks were. Most people think of biobanks as um, uh, collections of human tissue, for example, cancer tissue, uh, if they understand biobanking at all. And the, the other people that we come across often think we're essentially facilitating um, some kind of dystopian Jurassic Park future and, uh, and building, you know, building dinosaurs, et cetera. Um, we've been collaborating with a lot of existing programs. As I said before, we're trying to build sustainability into the program. So there's been a, an ongoing program called the Darwin Tree of Life Initiative in the UK, where um, the idea is to sequence the genomes of all British fauna and flora. Um, and we have been um, working with them to archive um, the material which has been used to produce that uh, sequencing database, um, particularly on the invertebrate side where cryopreservation is actually quite challenging. But we've also been working with other bodies, for example, um, the UK Wildlife Veterinary Investigation Centre, which collects uh, material from many, many um, different species um, that have had, uh, that have come through the vet ordinary veterinary surgeries, um, but which may actually be very valuable um, and particularly wild species. But there are many other collections that we've been collaborating with. Um, but the most important thing that we've focused on is building the community. Um, and this is because uh, this project will not work unless we actually uh, build a community where people feel as though that their, their, um, their opinions and their engagement is valued. Um, and so making samples available is one side of the, um, the process, but we also just took an early decision that people who wish to keep their samples, maybe because they were still carrying out research on them, and maybe because they still had to publish stuff about them, would have the opportunity to send us those samples in data only format. So um, at this way, the samples may not be physically located in one of our freezers, but they're discoverable. They are, um, there are potential then for collaboration with those um, investigators. Um, and uh, we will ensure that the material that is uh, where we only have the data is properly retained and managed. So we require the, the people that, that do it that way to, um, to uh, provide us evidence that the material is properly curated. Um, and also, of course, what we do is provide um, data to people and we will back up their collections. So if you have a collection of material that is in an old minus 20 freezer that's 10 years old and could go down at any stage, um, we can back those samples up or a proportion of them and offer long term storage um, and in a secure facility where we have all of the bells and whistles, for example, alarms and um, backup freezing um, uh, uh, infrastructure. 
Um, we also have been doing a huge amount of work with the community to understand um, their roles and responsibilities with, for example, the Nagoya Protocol in mind. So um, we, we, we have produced a whole series of different documents in and around um, samples, the curation of samples. We've produced a number of guidelines on setting up your own biobank. Um, and, um, and that allows us then to, uh, to help guide the community towards a common set of standards. So basically what happens is that people will contact us. We will ask them for some general information. They will then fill out a, uh, a loans um, a request or, or, or a donation uh, document. And, and that material will then either be loaned or if there are still queries about it, we'll come back to them. Um, and we make sure always that the correct paperwork, correct material transfer agreements, data transfer agreements are in place and then the transfer happens and then the material is available via our portal. Um, as I said before, I'm not gonna take you through the database, but um, there, you, if you go on our website, you can search the database um, and, and it allows you to locate uh, material. More material is going in there all the time. So if you don't find things in there now that you need, that doesn't mean to say there won't be more going in um, in, in the coming years. Um, the idea is to make this uh, um, collection as large as it possibly can be. Also, if you would like to contribute material, um, we would be delighted to hear from you as well. So um, this is what part of the website looks like. Um, we try to make it as simple as possible. You can download all of the forms to request samples, um, download the guidance for those forms, or even fill them online. Um, and, and we try to process the material as quickly as we can, usually uh, within a month or so, uh, the, the, the request that we receive. Um, so, yeah, the, I would urge you, if you're interested, to visit the website and um, you'll be able to get all of the um, material that you need. So that's really what the Cryox Biobank is um, about. Um, these are the questions, or the modified versions of the questions that Flint um, uh, sent me. Um, and I, re I recognize, of course, that because most of you are dealing with long dead material, that the relevance of biobanks to zoo archaeology um, can be um, uh, tenuous, although as increasingly, I think one of the really exciting developments in the genetic component of zoo archaeology is comparison of ancient and modern material. As the technology comes together now for genetic analysis of very ancient material, you know, we've just passed the one million year mark um, in terms of DNA retrieval. Um, that is a that becomes very interesting and, and goes back to that first research framework um, uh, slide that I put up. So what's the perception and understanding of biobanks in your community? Can evident, how can evidence from biobanks contribute to zooarchaeological research? Um, how can the archaeological study of context contribute to understanding our data, the animal tissue data preserved in biobanks? And I think that that's a critical question. Um, and, and then there's a, a, a very practical question about, um, you know, improving excavation lab and analytical measure, uh, methods to incorporate and collaborate the data um, with that of uh, people working on modern material uh, more, uh, more easily. And, and for me, one of the really um, key questions is how can we apply research into modern thre threatened species or animal populations to understand the disappearance of past animal populations, except personally, I come from it the other way around. So we like to learn lessons from the past. So in, in a sense, uh, in order to predict the future, understanding what's happened in the past is actually a very uh, important component of our research. And then finally, how can the study of human hunting and herding practices in the past add context to preserve samples in biobanks? Um, and, and there's a you know, very, very um, key role, I think, of understanding uh, past demographic processes uh, of which hunting is a key factor um, and, and also domestication, of course. And, um, and I'm, I know many of you have worked on that in that area. So I, I kept it brief, um, but if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. And thank you very much for listening.